Dr. Caitlin Rubley is an assistant professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Colorado. She serves as the director of graduate medical education with the Climate and Health Program through the School of Medicine and assistant fellowship director for the Climate and Health Science Policy Fellowship. So what do you think we were talking about today? That's right climate change and its impact on the practice of medicine. So we talk about what she's hoarding in her bunker with the coming societal collapse from climate change. Actually, she's a lot more hopeful about it than I am, um, which is clearly reflected in our discussion. So we talk about what gives her hope. Uh, That being said, we need to be prepared. So we talk about what we should expect, likely more mosquito-borne illnesses, climate refugees, more issues with supply chains causing us to practice with scarcity. We also talk about why climate change is a social justice issue and what we can do if this conversation terrifies or inspires you. Probably a bit of both. Dr. Rubley is the 2022 to 2024 American Board of Emergency Medicine National Academy of Medicine Fellow. She researched her MD, MPH dual degree from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. She completed a residency in emergency medicine at The Ohio State University, followed by a one-year climate and health science policy fellowship at the University of Colorado. Welcome to the Physician's Guide to Doctoring, a practical guide for practicing physicians. Dr. Bradley Block interviews experts in and out of medicine to find out everything we should have been learning while we were memorizing Krebs cycle. The ideas expressed on this podcast are those of the interviewer and interviewee and do not represent those of their respective employers. And now, here's Dr. Bradley Block. Dr. Caitlin Rubley, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hello. Good day. Thanks so much for having me. It is excellent to bring us together here across the country to talk about one of my favorite things. And one of the things that terrifies me the most. So, you know, in the arc of the interview, we're going to, you know, I think start off scaring the crap out of people and then and then we'll end on a high note. So make sure so you don't end up with the climate anxiety that I have that you listen to the end. Okay. So the first question, first question, do you have a bunker somewhere where you are storing years of food, water, medical supply, and most importantly, guns? Mm. Oh, you weren't supposed to ask this question. It was on the secret list, but I do, I do. And I'm an ER doc, right? So I think very practical, objective, and things like tissue adhesive have to make the list, basics like water that we can drink just in case um, there's water scarcity around. And then, oh, definitely a life jacket too and a helmet just in case. You never know. We, we talk about prevention, upstream factors, preventing people from coming to the ER. Um, those are my go-to. Uh, if I had to pick a medication. Wait, I'm sorry. Where do you live? I'm in Colorado. And why do you need a life jacket in Colorado? Floods. They happen here too. Really? Yeah. Floods. Wow. There's this thing called climate change. Energized (laughs) systems, extremes. Uh, So even that, we always talk about the heat, uh, the temperature and the humidity, but it's also more extreme winter events too, like what we saw in Texas with the cold snap. So I'm prepared for anything. Maybe even an ultrasound and ketamine too. Okay. Okay. So, so yeah, that was the, the, the medical supplies that you're hoarding. So, okay. So you've got yeah. tissue adhesive, you've got an ultrasound, um, any, anything else like antibiotics, vitamins, maybe one antibiotic, maybe, maybe, mm, septinir. I'll go with septinir. Okay. Okay. Just in case. Okay. Well, there's a shortage for kids right now. There's a shortage of septinir. There is. For- there is the liquid unfortunately so and 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 actually we're going to be getting to that in a little bit um you know with actually let's just talk about it so so when with climate change right what like there's going to be more scarcity right it's going to affect our supply chain which we've been hearing a lot about since the start of covid right and so where in our supply chain materials do you think where we're most vulnerable, where physicians might have to get used to working without? 
Yeah, I think that's a very astute point. So most of the time when I talk about climate change and I talk about it with scientists, with clinicians like yourself, with policymakers, it's very much about health impact. So how is climate change affecting me right here, right now, and what can we do about it? So it's very simply things like heat stress, right? If, if it's uh, more humid, if the temperatures are higher uh, and there's almost 8 billion people on this planet, you're more likely to get exposed and get really, really sick and even die related to heat. Uh, I think some of the other intersections with climate change are, are less noticeable to the vast majority of people. So you mentioned shortages. This is one thing I think about all the time. What are the impacts of extreme heat, wildfires, inland and coastal flooding, water scarcity to our health systems? How do we continue to provide high quality time sensitive care with fewer supply chain resources? So some of the shortages are, are well known. So remember um, our, we had Hurricane Maria a few years ago and that hit Puerto Rico, knocked out a large producer of, of carrier fluid for the United States. And we had normal saline shortages for well over a year. Uh, just because that's where they are manufactured. And that was, again, far away from the impact. There are other shortages that I think about in regards to medications, antibiotics. One example would be something like inhalers, right? So say there's these big wildfires and a bunch of people are exposed and they all need inhalers. How do we ensure and prepare ahead of time to make sure that we have those medications, especially for those most in need? And then the other shortage that I think about are people. It takes a whole healthcare team to provide high quality care to patients. That might be in the operating theater, it might be in the emergency department or clinic, all of the technicians to run CAT scans, MRIs, uh, uh, respiratory therapists, uh, and many others, nurses, pharmacists that just make our system operate. So in the setting of disaster, how do we ensure they're safe and get to work too? So we're going to have to get used to living without fluids, antibiotics, and people, even though there are too many people. There are too there many, are. 8 billion people. We just hit 8 billion people on the planet, yet yet we might not have enough people to help us run our healthcare system. Okay. Um, well, what would you say to physicians who have already considered fast forwarding to the next podcast episode, they're like, you know what? This is not our lane. What would you say to them? Just take a look at your patients, the patients that you see and what it takes to run uh, your practice. Think about very simply, you know, I walk into the emergency department, log into the computer, all the energy it takes in order to to run a computer and electronic medical record, to order uh, imaging, even a simple x-ray. In many parts of this world, something like a portable x-ray is a rate limiting step during disaster. And so thinking about that, much less CAT scans and MRIs and then surgical suites and all of the energy to run the instruments and processes uh, to care for these individuals. When disruptions happen, people notice it. Uh, but until that time, a lot, a lot of them say this isn't, isn't an issue. I would say taking a step back too and looking at just costs. So in the United States, there are $800 billion in healthcare costs related to climate change and air pollution every year. And uh, I mean, most people have no idea about the impact to our patients. I can walk into a shift in the emergency department and care for someone with an asthma exacerbation, care for someone with uh, a new infectious disease. So in the Midwest, it's something like Lyme's disease or um, here it's West Nile virus. And knowing that there's an increase in neuroinvasive cases of West Nile disease, mosquito-borne illness. A lot of people don't think about it or know about it. Along our coasts, uh, after a lot of these storms, most recently, we had Hurricane Ian. Vibrio infections were really common. So it could be simple soft skin and soft tissue infections, or it can be a necrotizing uh, skin and soft tissue infection that ultimately 
um, results in the patient's death. So there are many different intersections. And then um, if our goal is to provide high quality care, we have to be able to one, recognize many of these climate related conditions, disease processes, as well as injuries that result. And number two, think about the increased mobility of people here in, we're almost to 2023 uh, in this world. I mean, it's easy to fly from one continent to the other. Uh, unfortunately, climate related stressors are contributing to mass migration and mobility of people such that in my emergency department, I am seeing somebody from across the ocean and having to think about local climate hazards there that I might not have to think about right here in Colorado. Is this something that you talk to your patients about? Like, do you, do you talk to them about the hazards of climate change? I do. How does that come up in conversation? Yeah. It's just like, welcome to the emergency department. I'm Dr. Rubley. Let's talk about climate change. Um, <laughs> do you know why you're having difficulty breathing right now? Climate. Is that, that, and that's because yes, this wildfire is as bad as it is because of climate change. What car did you drive here? Yeah. Wasn't a Prius? No? Yeah. No, no. Um, it does come up. And I think I recognize through this lens of opportunity, the intersections much more than, than other clinicians, perhaps, who have less training structured or unstructured uh, in this field. So number one is recognizing the disproportionate impacts to patients in our communities. So uh, just depending on their zip code, for example, if they're in a poorer part of the city, if they're in um, downtown inner city, more, we call it the urban heat island. So more concrete, more buildings just holds the heat. Um, thinking about some of those aspects, as well as even like outdoor workers, agriculture workers being exposed to heat more, um, I'll talk to them. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of patients don't know that they can actually die from heat. Um, and so I'll actually bring up if they have a phone um, or if I have the interpreter up, for example, too, if they're non-English speaking, I'll go through uh, air quality index, for example, and somebody who has asthma and kind of walk them through the different numbers and colors and say when it's right here, uh, you should try and avoid being outside much more because your asthma, for example, is, is likely to get much, much worse. Um, they come but in this with sounds like someone who might be living paycheck to paycheck. Who's going yeah. to say, listen, I can't do that. I can't do that because then I won't work and I won't make rent and I can't feed my family. Yeah. And that's, that's the hard part about our job is essentially individualizing the care we provide for the patient. And so people say, you know, climate justice, um, social justice. The reason why I do this work is because of that. I think it's this huge opportunity to actually address some of the health disparities and inequities that are so prevalent uh, in each city, in our states, in our country, and across our, our world, quite frankly, um, to improve health and well being, keep people out of the emergency department. So, if, for example, a patient like that um, is like, no, I can't do that, we'll take a step back and say, what can we do? Fortunately, a lot of cities have really great resources, um, and one of them is in regards to energy. There's some really great work being done by organizations um, looking at energy poverty. So um, redlining or is one example where historic housing policies, uh, which are now outlawed, but to this day, disproportionately burden specific areas of cities. And unfortunately, many of my patients, especially Black patients, live in these areas that were formerly redlined. We know these areas are hotter, have less green space, more oil and gas wells, worse air quality. Um, and so I, I talked to them about uh, their energy burden. They're fr frequently, many of them are paying a lot more than some of the white suburbs for uh, their energy, for example, just to cool uh, their apartment uh, in the summer or warm their apartment in the winter. And so I connect them with community resources, working with social workers, case managers that can reduce some of those expenses. And then do you want to know what I do? I step yes. outside of the hospital 
and talk with organizations, policymakers, and say, what can we do? What can we do to address these upstream factors that are affecting my patients um, that, you know, quite frankly, are, are not necessary anymore. And I really help to educate and communicate um, my patients' experiences that I'm so privileged to hear uh, while, while I work in the hospital. So for those who are looking to, you know, address social justice issues, clearly, you know, climate change, by addressing climate change, you are addressing social justice issues. And for those who tend to favor their wallet when they're choosing to vote because climate change is leading to so many expensive, one, all the natural disasters that then we have to, you know, clean up afterwards costs money. And then, as you said, what was the what was the price tag on climate related health issues? Eight hundred billion dollars. Eight hundred billion dollars. So if you're looking to save on taxes, well, if we could, you know, take pay eight hundred billion dollars in fewer taxes, then then you it wouldn't come out of your wallet. So it doesn't matter which what what is incentivizing you to vote a certain way. It really should be. I mean, really, it's. We haven't gotten to this part of it yet, but it's an existential threat aside from aside from that. Like you you said before the show, your hope is in human ingenuity to avoid this existential threat. Um, I tend to think that human beings are short sighted and egocentric and we're looking to, you know, make decisions from quarter to quarter. Um, so. Uh, I don't know if human ingenuity is going to then uh, supplant our our egocentric, selfish ways, but you know, sorry, that was <laughs> a little bit. No, it's. I mean, little, it's little so much of what we are here and now too, and what you're exposed to. I think I have the privilege of being contacted every week by this growing number of of students and trainees that are so engaged and so informed. I mean, quite frankly, this is very practical and common sense for me. I mean, we know enough. They've been doing intergovernmental panel on climate change reports my whole life. They have a national climate assessment. They have this. So I just got back not too long ago from the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Egypt, COP27. And so there you have an entire uh, world of negotiators and non-governmental organizations and clinicians and increasingly the health voice coming together saying the climate crisis is a, is a health emergency. We cannot wait. Um, and this is this is our lane. This is our lane today, and it's our lane uh, increasingly. If I think about my career in the next thirty years, what's going to happen to it? I mean, if COVID wasn't a stark wake up call for any of us of what we expect our community members to know about health in general, just basic health literacy, I don't know. I, you know, if that isn't incentive enough. Um, I think a lot of people are really afraid of the word policy, but for me, I love it. It's really just a, a guidance uh, for action. So some sort of plan uh, for action. And so we, we deal with policies all the time, right? Hand hygiene in the, in the hospital or in our clinics, um, policies related to surgical suites, policies related to um, you know, quality improvement practices. So really, I think of this as no different. And um, the other component about it, you mentioned money, and I'm no economist, so I would invite them on next week's podcast for the climate <laughs> crisis, is how we are going to transform global investment uh, in the setting of the climate crisis, which is a hot topic right now, but is thinking about our own health sector's impact on warming. So in the United States, 8.5% of greenhouse gas emissions are from the health sector. 8.5%. Now that number, you know, what's an emission? Like, you know, what's a percentage? But essentially in providing care, we're contributing to ongoing pollution and harms where these hospitals and clinics are at. Now think about your own practice. Not only that, but the endless trash we produce. Exactly. Holy cow. All Everything is so disposable. Like it's... You know, in other countries, they reuse gloves and their outcomes aren't that different than ours. And and we here we are throwing out everything. So it's not just greenhouse gases. It's all the trash that we're creating. 
It's the trash, it's, it's the food and nutrition to, you know, support patients. And just think about the trash cans and, and all the food and, and empty, you know, the undrink juice that just gets thrown away. All the oxygen tubing, um, all the, I mean, that's default. What happens if the default was a different standard yeah. and a standard that whereby, you know, it, it reduced costs to the health system when improved patient care and satisfaction when and improved retention and recruitment of physicians who are increasingly conscious about our current impact. Um, and then we just scaled it up. Why not? But then Jake was going to come in and be like, really, you're reusing that? No, no, no. You've got to throw that away. You're going to have to throw that away. You know, like that we've got these these oversight, even after when we, we went through with COVID, sometimes we have this oversight that's a little, you know, draconian. Yeah. Yeah. So, and so, I think that's, really, that's where policy comes in. We got to, well, you know, policy. we got to create policy. Yeah. And learning too from other countries. You mentioned many other countries in the world, you know, doing the same surgery. And cataract surgery is a great example. There's some excellent literature out there on outcomes, which are favorable and reduced waste and processes. And so, again, sorry, what kind of surgery? Cataract surgery. Oh, cataract surgery. With ophthalmologists. So just think about your own practice. And I mean, some of these small changes uh, can have really significant impacts. Um, I did an, my own quality improvement project of just changing um, medications, IV push from piggyback. Um, and I would I would say even more, you can take oral medicines, right? How often do we give IV and it could just be an oral medicine um, or just some of those simple changes that can really have a, an impact. Um, I well, do speaking a lot of, of incentive. Sometimes you can bill more for giving IV medicine rather than oral right? Higher complexity of care, something like that. So, you know, there's, there are incentives in there that we need to maybe address. Um, I mean, there's certainly there'd be some pushback on there, but um, yeah, it's all, it's all so intertwined, but to your point, follow the money. If you can incentivize the hospital, oh, you're going to save money if you do this. Oh, great. Great. You're going to save the planet. Wow. Great. Then we can write it. We can, we can do a um, PR stint about it and show how we're saving the planet, but really let's do it because we're saving the money. Yeah. And I would, I mean, I would really go back to patient care too. So again, I was just with a whole uh, network of clinicians from around the world. And one of the uh, uh, thoracic surgeons, amazing uh, picture of, of lungs. And he sees the, you know, the lungs all the time, right? So healthy lungs compared to lungs that have been exposed to air pollution, they're black, you know, clearly not healthy. And so go back to your own patient set uh, and think like, why are we doing this? Why are we clinicians in the first place? Why are we running these systems? And it's really to support health and well-being. And, and that includes uh, behavioral health, right? So thinking about the mental health impacts of climate change too. Uh, any of these events, if you have a tropical storm and are displaced, uh, I mean, I, I talk to a lot of patients who are forced to leave their families and physically move uh, in the setting of extreme stress. They lose their jobs, they lose all sorts of social stability, and they start over. And 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 that's hard for anyone. But then think about it. In, in the setting of patients who already have several barriers to care and barriers to well-being, um, and it frequently becomes becomes too much. So, again, thinking about ways we can address these holistically, um, really, I think one improving health and education uh, on the impacts, as I've talked about. Number two, thinking about it as a health and equity opportunity. Really, climate solutions are health solutions. Um, I do a lot of work uh, on the African continent and in low and middle income countries. So they already talk about climate change in everyday language because they've been disproportionately burdened and suffer the effects already. They talk about the floods and the droughts and the heat waves and um, the food insecurity. Again, going back to the essential medications, food, water, shelter, um, and all of that is disrupted in many ways by the climate crisis. So how can we as clinicians really be a leverage in our community and, and talk about this and think about this and say, here's what we're going to do. 
We're going to mobilize our professional um, societies. We're going to mobilize our health system. We're going to mo mobilize our community organizations. We're going to write. We're going to speak. We're going to do. Um, because quite frankly, um, we can, you know, I think about it for in the next 30 years of my career. Uh, I don't want to accept what has been the last few years. And so really, I think about this as a profound opportunity to transform our systems and really uh, catalyze change that supports health and well-being, not just for a day um, or as a Band-Aid, but really for the long term. So if you have a, a physician listening and they're inspired or terrified, you know, but either way, either emotion they're going to follow and they want to start getting involved. What is, you know, this can seem really overwhelming, right? Like, I, I mean, I think of it as like we're skiers and an avalanche is just coming, right? So um, what do we do? You know, what does someone do? How do we start dipping our toes in? to start getting involved? Yeah. So number one, I think that's a very normal response to a lot of people. And one of the energizing pieces when I started this work a few years ago was really colleagues uh, in medicine coming to me and saying, you know, Caitlin, I can deal with uh, this disaster and this thing and this, you know, uh, admin problem, but the climate crisis scares me. That's what keeps me awake at night. It's for my kids, it's for my family. Um, and it's deeply personal. So I would say, number one, it's very normal to feel that way. Um, and uh, I've even had people come to organizations and meetings with tears in their eyes after having read something. Um, unfortunately, the communication on climate change hasn't been super positive or energizing or inspiring. Um, it depends, again, what your source of news is. Uh, but I think from a very practical and realistic manner, we know enough. Um, and number two, what are we going to do? So next steps that you can take on a very individual level would be uh, find find your, your group or team member. So that might be an interest group, a climate change interest group as part of your professional society. There are many state chapters through the National Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health that are mobilizing clinicians, um, nursing, physicians, physical therapists, occupational therapists, and others um, who have a streamlined working groups and specific action items where they can have an impact and are making impacts um, at, on a local and global scale. I would say number two, uh, go towards what interests you. So some people love to write. So if that is you and you want to try your hand at an opinion piece talking about um, climate change and heat in your uh, in your community of uh, where you practice and how that's impacting your patients, it could be really effective. Um, others enjoy public speaking. And so getting up and talking with uh, a school, for example, um, or um, one of the local clubs can be uh, really rewarding. Um, and a lot of people have found kind of collection, collective action with them. I would say three on a much larger scale, um, just engaging with your uh, hospital and health system um, is, uh, is a next step for transforming more uh, system level changes. So for example, I mentioned some of the medication changes. There are others that form green teams that looked at changing their food and nutrition into local farmers uh, and producers, whereby there was this really beautiful partnership um, where they supported local farmers um, and getting plant-based diets at least some days of the week. They worked with their chefs to reduce food waste, and then they worked with their patients and staff to actually get them food and items that they were really interested in and were very appealing to them. So that's just one example um, in regards to um, a health system change. Another entity is transportation. So some health systems have worked with their employees to create transportation action plans to reduce transportation in regards to individual vehicles from staff and patients. Um, and so what that looks like for your health system in an urban or rural place uh, varies, right? If you're at a critical access hospital, it would look very different than if you were at an urban level one trauma center. Um, but there are a lot of health systems coming together and getting 
getting the right business, clinician, um, policymakers at the table to say, what can we do? What's feasible? Um, and here are the next steps for action. And then holding each other accountable, holding each other accountable. Because to this point, and I think it's safe to say, um, you know, more and more good has been done to address the climate crisis as a, as a health crisis, but there is so much more that needs to be done. And so in order to make that happen, something has to change. And so um, for me, it's really saying, you know, an, we're done talking, like, what are you going to do? Um, and then measure, if you're concerned about costs, uh, hire a designated person or a leader and, and measure a return on investment. Gunderson Health System is an excellent example in Wisconsin, where whereby they achieved energy efficiency. And their, uh, their uh, um, leader of their health system partnered closely with an engineer. And they measured return on investment for all of the energy changes that they made in a very positive sense. And so I would say to, to other health system leaders, talk with your cohort, see what others are doing and have this shared vision um, with the underlying mission being let's support patient and community health. Yeah, you make you make great point. Those were great ideas for for getting involved. You make great points about how we have to hold the health systems accountable. It was like when CVS was selling cigarettes. You know, like how do you claim to be a pharmacy whose goal is to improve people's health outcomes and you're selling cigarettes? You can't do both these at the same time. So how can we claim to be health core organizations when one of the leading drivers of poor health outcomes is and will continue to be climate change. If we're not addressing that, then we're we're really not, you know, we're in the business of selling health care, but we're not in the business of really defining ourselves by health care. Yeah. And I think that's that's a minority of people. Certainly I'm a a, a frontline worker. I'm an assistant professor. I have no, you know, C-suite access. Um, but I would say to that them or that comment, um, I would just challenge you that it's coming, right? So this is not going to be something that will be optional, in my opinion, um, in, in several years. Uh, this is something that people are already working together. You mentioned Jayco, you mentioned um, health system leaders, engineers, all of these professional societies, they are coming together uh, and and having these conversations about how do we transform financing? How do we talk about health insurance um, and reimbursement? Is this a of interest to the insurance companies? And the answer is you bet. So I think, again, there are many, many solutions. Um, if you're interested, the National Academy of Medicine is doing a lot of great work in regards to having some of these um, experts on board to talk about specific disciplines as it intersects with health um, and our healthcare systems. Um, so that would be another area where you could uh, evaluate opportunities. But really, again, I think trying to find the hole within your own local practice of opportunity um, and then running with it. Uh, I think a lot of people say, I don't know enough, right? I'm not, I'm not good enough. I don't have the position, uh, but we've seen uh, medical students, trainees, we've seen, you know, junior faculty, we've seen people all over this country really uh, catalyze action and set examples for what, what it can look like to be a physician, um, evidence-informed physician advocate outside of the hospital and clinic. Yeah. You don't need to be Anthony Fauci in order to talk about SARS-CoV-2, right? Lots of people can talk about that. So, um, you know, we have a lot of imposter syndrome in medicine and we're experts and we're community leaders. And, you know, you can leverage that to, you know, get an audience if you're, if you're looking for an audience and leverage your expertise and then, you know, create a team. You feel like you're not comfortable with something find someone who is and and then you leverage your title and 
authority and network to uh, you know other community members in order to to create as much change as you can. You got we it. under we underestimate what who we know and how much respect we already have in the community, even though we're not the world, because we always think like, well, I'm not the world expert on this. So I, you know, I really shouldn't be given that grand rounds. No, you should be, you should be. And it's about communication. You mentioned COVID and that was an excellent example of the, the results of poor communication and mistrust. So again, if we back off and say we're communicating risk, in some instances, that's what climate change is. Do I communicate risk to patients in the emergency department? Every day, every day, right? What's your heart score, your chest pain, your shortness of breath? Am I concerned? Am I not concerned? And so I think it's just another form of risk communication. And the more you do it, the better you get at it. I think an excellent example is from our meteorologic colleagues, broadcasters. So they they talk about the weather. So there was this initiative, Dr. Ed Maybach, um, he's out of George Mason, but he partnered with meteorologists to talk about climate change and communication because they have the public view. Um, and it was profoundly impactful at essentially addressing some of the misperceptions that the general public has in regards to climate change and, and what's actually happening and what do we know and what don't we know. So this idea of communicating uncertainty is, is of significant interest. And I mean, quite frankly, I, you know, like I said, there's people trust us all the time with these decisions where we know so, so much less, quite frankly. Um, than what we know about climate change. And so really, it, again, moving beyond that and saying, okay, here's what we're going to do about it. So let's, on, let's end on a high note. What gives you hope? I get this question a lot. And I'm almost like, how can you not be hopeful? How oh, I, I mean, if you really hopeful? want me to answer that question, I, 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 think, <laughs> no. I, did. I think I did no. earlier. I can, I can go, I can, you know, probably talk for 45 minutes on why I'm not. Yeah, hopeful, but... yeah. So again, I think about, everything that has happened. I mean, we were talking about the Egyptian pyramids the other day, about technology and the advent of these phones and computers and artificial intelligence. And it just, it's amazing to me. And you talk to these tech people and they have a million more ideas. Um, I think about the climate crisis as just implementation of simple practical solutions that are going to transform a system. And you know, what are these solutions? There are many, and there are folders, quite frankly, file folders full of, of policies um, by any of these people. Uh, but what does it look like to transform these systems with health and equity in mind? Uh, and so that brings, as you mentioned earlier, the human potential. So all of these young students are knocking on our doors. They are saying, we are going to do something. We want to do something. Um, this is you know, not an acceptable standard. And so with the masses that we have across disciplines, I have no doubt that we are gonna get at the tables and craft these solutions. The question is, will it be soon enough? Um, and will we be able to implement them in a manner um, whereby the right uh, groups are, are supported, right? So we've seen in the past from history how implementation of policies can go really wrong. And that might be at a very local level in a health system or in a community, or it might, might be on a much broader scale on a national level or international level. So the Inflation Reduction Act is one example of policies that, you know, that was recently passed. But what does actual implementation look like in regards to health and equity? And how, we can, how can we ensure that um, those people who are impacted the most um, are, are supported in a manner that goes beyond verbiage and dialogue? Um, and and that, that will mean authentic partnerships, authentic partnerships with people who care. And I think that trust, that empathy, and that love um, can surpass 
just about anything. Um, if we if we find the will to come together and say we value each other, we value each other's health, we value each other's time, and um, you know that's something worth fighting for. Giving us all more birthdays and holidays and celebrations um, so that that we can continue um, to to enjoy our communities and and the ones we love. So if you want to direct anyone towards climate resources, if we want to, if you want some more information or we want to find you, um, you know, where can we find you know, if you're if you're active on social media or you want us to send us towards some outside resources, where uh, where are you going to send us? Absolutely. So nationally, you can look at the Medical Society Consortium on Climate and Health. They have uh, a, a whole slew of clinicians involved uh, and they can plug you in. There are also state chapters uh, that can get you involved. And so again, finding your network, finding your group, um, looking into your professional society organization is really important as well. Uh, internal medicine, emergency medicine, definitely have climate change interest groups. So look into your own. If there isn't one, start one uh, and run with it. Uh, there is also a lot of work being done at the academic level. And so here at the University of Colorado, for example, we have a dedicated fellowship for ph physicians who want an extra year of training in climate sciences and climate change and health and have a little bit of time in order to um, engage with all these different stakeholders and learn some of the skills so necessary to um, implementing um, smart policies. Uh, there is also uh, a diploma in climate medicine uh, where you can, over a couple of years, years, use your CME uh, to learn climate change. And then um, I tell everyone there are an increasing number of resources online such that, again, you don't need structured training. You don't need uh, necessarily a, a two-year master's program in order to get this information where you make a difference. Um, so just search the literature. Um, the National Climate Assessment has a human health chapter. If you really want to dive deep, they're working on the fifth one right now. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has climate science, but I will tell you is thousands and thousands of pages of reports. And so that might not uh, be the best right before bed um, or before clinic to put you or to sleep. It, or yeah, or it will be the best right before bed, actually. Yeah, yeah, maybe it will crash. Um, and then lastly, I would just uh, 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 encourage you to uh, look into the American Public Health Association because they have a lot of uh, quick resources on the um, environmental justice and what climate justice looks like. And then um, Columbia University as well has a whole host of resources for health professionals where you can click on a specific disease process, for example, um, or, or disorder. So for example, if you're a cardiologist, you can click on cardiology and then there are some slide decks, there are some papers and other inf information specific to you. Um, and so I encourage everyone just incorporate one slide. Uh, on climate impacts in your next talk. Uh, encourage your students to do a quality improvement project on climate change uh, and really just support the, the leaders and the growing interest, interested humans around you. So um, we can, if we all do a little bit, we can make a really big difference. And as you said at the beginning, lots of opportunity. There's lots of opportunity there. So if you're an ambitious pre-med or medical student, or resident fellow, you need a project. Uh, these are these are all gr great places to look. Well, Dr. Caitlin Rubley, thank you so much for your time and for all your hard work on uh, saving us from ourselves. Thank you for the invitation. And um, we we've got this. That was Dr. Bradley Block at the Physician's Guide to Doctoring. He can be found at physiciansguidetodoctoring.com or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a question for a previous guest or have an idea for a future episode, send a comment on the webpage. Also, please be sure to leave a five-star review on your preferred podcast platform. We'll see you next time on the Physician's Guide to Doctoring.